Wire to Wire is the story of a young man, Michael Slater, who returns to northern Michigan after a long time away and immediately uh, uh, falls in love with the wrong woman. He's involved in a love triangle uh, with a woman who is uh, uh, attractive, seductive, but also very self-destructive. And at the same time, he gets drawn up in the schemes of a corrupt sheriff and uh, a drug dealer in northern Michigan. Uh, meanwhile, he has problems of his own. He was standing on top of a moving boxcar trying to light a joint when he got hit by a power line. And so he sees things that aren't there and uh, has to deal with that. Uh, he, he also has the misfortune of having been given a car, a 1967 Ford Ranchero, that uh, unbeknownst to him is full of drug money and the, uh, the drug dealer whose money it is, is after him. So there is a, a, a lot of um, elements of a crime novel. Uh, the publisher calls it a, an homage to a crime novel, which I think means it's got the same elements as a crime novel, but maybe in a slightly, treated in a slightly new way. I think of it as, you know, it's either a crime novel with a, with a sensitive heart or, or it's literary fiction with a, with a strong plot. Seeing things that aren't there are always fun. <laughs> <laughs> they are, aren't they? I, I think that's one of the most fun things in life. <laughs> I think the way you put the plot together and the flashbacks and the present tense and the past, I think it's wonderful. Well, I thank you. It took me a few pages to get into it, but it, once I was there, it was just like hopping the trains. I, I could imagine. I, I yeah. never hopped it. It was great. I really recommend it to anybody, everybody. I'm from Jackson, Michigan. I grew up out of town, outside of town in Jackson, um, probably two, three miles outside town in a subdivision that didn't really take off. And the only thing around were railroad tracks. So you know, when we wanted to do something, where we went was to the railroad tracks, really just to get away from adults, not so much to ride trains. Um, but then the train started going by and we'd grab on. I figured that had to be your background somehow. And how long have you been writing? Started writing nonfiction. I started writing nonfiction in high school, and I wanted to be a journalist, I wanted to be a reporter, and was editor of my college paper. And this was right about the time of Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate, and it just opened up the floodgates so everybody wanted to be a reporter around that time. And I did get a few jobs, but it was, the competition was tough. And it wasn't until I was 30 when I kind of accidentally kind of happened into a class on fiction, and it was the evening of my 30th birthday, and I left there after two, three hours listening to the teacher thinking, this is what I want to do. Oh, that's great. I mean, that's good for us. <laughs> uh, and what we're, now you'll find that a lot of the questions they have are, are stereotypical and fawning, probably. But <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, that'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you been writing? You covered that. What were some of your early influences, uh, not only fiction, but nonfiction as well? Well, in the class that I took, uh, the person who's teaching it, Read, read us a little Robert Stone, uh, a little Tim O'Brien going after Casciato, oh, yeah. uh, Dog Soldiers. Those were really influential. And this, just the sound of those, third person, um, lots of dialogue, not very much exposition. And then I began seeking those kinds of things out. I wanted to read more of that, more of that style. Um, I, I like Stephen Wright. Meditations in Green was a really influential book early on, and, and so was Dispatches, although that was nonfiction and that was first person. But it did have kind of the dreamy quality that that, that I really that I really liked. Um, I'm going to skip around a little bit. Uh, Tin House is, and I, I love. I didn't know they had a, a publishing house that is the same one as the yeah. as the periodical. And did you shop them first, or how did you come about <laughs> with Tin House? Uh, I like to say that I got published the same way that I used to meet women when I was young, by doing absolutely nothing and just waiting to see what would happen. <laughs> I, which is probably why it took so long. Uh, <coughs> although it does work if you've got decades to spare. Uh, I, I had finished the manuscript 
and another person in the group that I was in, I was in a writing group, and, and someone else in the group, uh, I, I, I ran into this person around Portland, and she said, listen, you really ought to give this manuscript to Tin House. They would love it. Yeah. And I'd heard that something similar to that a lot. You really ought to give your manuscript to so-and-so. And usually you ended up never hearing anything back. And so when she said that, I, I nodded and said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And it just went in one ear and out the other. I mean, it was gone by the time she finished saying it. It wasn't one of those things that I thought of later and thought I ought to do. I mean, it, it was like it had never entered my mind. I run into her six months later. And she says, well, what did Tin House think of the book? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you did tell me to do that. And I, so I apologized to her that I hadn't done it. And she kind of rolled her eyes and said, listen, I'm, I'm having drinks with the editor next Tuesday. Can I give it to them? Wow. And even then I said, gee, I don't know if it's ready. And she said, I'm giving it to them. <laughs> so it got published kind of despite my own incompetence. <laughs> but I was just incredibly lucky, I think. I mean, it's, it's a perfect match, I think. Well, and is this your first one? It's first novel. I started it in, there's a draft that's dated July 15th, 1985. I put it aside for a long time, though. I, I didn't know, I mean, I came from this journalism background, and I knew how to put sentences together. I didn't know how to tell a narrative story. And so the early drafts have a lot of the train stuff that's in there now. They're in there, but there's no narrative story. The, the crime story is totally absent. Um, and so I would put it aside for a while. That's when I started the Seeger File, a website about Bob Seeger. People said, hey, you know a lot about Bob. You should write a book about Seeger. And I thought, you know, I'm just struggling to write a book already. <laughs> I'm just going to do a website. It's, it sounds easier. Um, I got married. I raised my son. My son's 18 years old. So a lot of other stuff happened. And I finally, um, about five years ago, started working, working with some teachers who really understood story. And that's when the story that carries you through there started to gel. So off and on over 20 years. Well, it's a, a unique uh, plot and pattern um, in Wire to Wire. And what caused you to zero in on, or, or did you have any control over that? Well, the frame story came from, I bought a, a computer, a personal computer really early. I bought my first uh, computer in 1983. You know, it had a screen about the size of an iPhone, <laughs> but the computer itself was this big and uh, took up the whole desk. Um, and, and I would just sit there watching the cursor blink. It was such a, such a new experience back then. Now we're used to it. But the cursor was just blinking at me, waiting for me to do something. And I kept thinking how nice it would be if I could see a picture on the screen. Because that's, you know, back then, that's what screens were for, watching pictures. And so the, the concept gradually came to me that this was, the story was maybe about someone seeing pictures on a screen and that they might get drawn into that screen and have access to their own memories and get a new appreciation for something that had happened earlier. So that concept was there really early. And I, the other thing I knew it would be about was Michigan. My, um, my dad grew up in Hillsdale and he, you know, Hillsdale, I, I remember it as a small town. I haven't been there in a while. But I bet it was a really small town in 1920. And somehow he got hired as the handyman at the girls' camp in Crystal Lake up by Frankfort, Michigan, when he was 17. And I think that just, I think that was like going to the moon for him. Uh, he fell in love with it. When he started a family, we were, I was born, we went up there every year. And, you know, so it's natural to me, and yet I'm, I, when I, I live out in Oregon, and people just have no clue that, it, that, that Michigan is anything other than, you know, the, the, the lower half of your palm. Yeah. Uh, and so I knew, okay, I'm going to write about, about northern Michigan, because it seems like a, a magical place people don't know about. And I knew I was going to write about freights, because I had ridden all across the country on freights. So, uh, so I knew there was something about involving freights in northern Michigan and these screens, and, and that's kind of what I knew starting out. What I, what I didn't have was any way to shape that into a story, so there was a lot of talking that didn't, 
didn't lead you anywhere. And I had, when I got done with the first draft, I actually, because I had spent a lot of time up in northern Michigan, and I, had, I used to go out and I would sometimes, you know, if you go, go out much around Leland area in the, in the old days, sooner or later you'd run into Jim Harrison. And so I'd seen him around and I'd said things like, you know, pass the ketchup or hi, but I didn't, I didn't know him. But I always told myself, when I get this done, I'm gonna get up my nerve and go up to him and say, I've written a novel, would you look at it? Well, by 1993, I was already in Portland and I had the first draft. And so I thought, well, I know where he lives. I mean, I don't know his, the name of that road, but I've been down that road dozens of times. I just wrote Jim Harrison, Lake Leland on Michigan, put my manuscript in there, sent it to him. Figured I'll never hear from him. Two weeks later, I get a letter from him saying, never do this again. <laughs> said, do you know how wrong this is and, <laughs> and how many manuscripts I get in my mailbox every day? <laughs> but he also said, hey, I glanced at it. The writing's pretty good. I'm going to forward it on to my agent. And uh, so I was, you know, cleaning out my desk, ready to you know, hit the big time. His agent wrote me and said, the writing is pretty good, but there, it needs to have a story. You're a first time author no one's going to buy this because the sentences are, are, are enjoyable or are good. Um, and so that really was the beginning of my, that, that turned on the light bulb that, okay, good writing alone is not going to be enough. I need a story to pull people through. That's good. I, that's, I'm glad they rejected it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took me a long time to, to learn that lesson. I mean, I'm a, I'm a slow learner in some ways. Um. Now, for, for uh, any of us beginners and writers and wannabes, what, what, what are your habits of style and, and writing? Your, I mean, your day-to-day -day habits, how do, you, how do you live your life as a writer? I like if to... If you want to share that. Yeah, uh, it's pretty, I mean, I, I'm happy to share it, but, but not to recommend it. <laughs> uh, since it, it, I mean, it, like I said, it works as long as you've got a couple decades. Um, I write at night when I, you know, I took this class in fiction that kind of changed my life and I decided that I was going to quit my job and write a book. I didn't actually quit my job, it was just one of those decisions that you make and you go around telling everybody about it but you don't actually do it. Um, and, and then finally, um, I was at a concert, uh, it, it happened to be a Prince concert. And I just had this moment where I said, I'm really going to do that. I'm really going to, and I quit my job within a week and wrote the first draft. I didn't write a word of it before midnight. I stayed up late every night. I started writing around 1 a.m., would write all night and sleep during the day. Uh, so, and that might have some, you know, the, I think that influenced the novel in certain ways. That only works for a while. Pretty soon you have to, to earn a living. And I got married and, and you know, had a son. Um, and so this, the, uh, my routine now is if I can get a little bit of writing done during the day, during lunch hour, sneak some in during work, it doesn't have to be good. Uh, as long as I've done something, it'll motivate me to go home. And after I'm done with family stuff around 9 o'clock, write, and I'll write from 9 till midnight if it's a good night. So it's always, you know, I hear most people, most of my writer friends say, I like to get up at six when my mind is fresh. And I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, my mind is not fresh at 6 a.m. So it's all, it's all late night for me. Um, do, do you have recommendations for you know, people who have manuscripts in, in their possession, finished ones, or in, in the works? and what? who they should approach, what should they do, where do they go, besides mailing them to marriage. Yeah, uh, don't do it like I did it. <laughs> you know, my first writer, writing teacher, the guy who changed my life, a writer named Jack Cady, not terribly well-known writer, um, but he, he got some recognition. He, he published a story in a magazine called Twigs, circulation maybe a couple hundred, got chosen by Joyce Carol Oates to, to be in a reprint. 
And after that, he, he did, had a string of four or five novels in a row that were fairly successful. He told me, uh, you know, never neglect, uh, you know, to focus on the writing and, and don't be distracted by all of the social and the networking part of it, but don't neglect that either. And I think I only took half of his, of his advice. I focused on the writing. I ended up uh, well into this without much of a network of support. And so um, I guess my advice would be to, to repeat the advice I didn't follow, which is it, it does matter to be part of a community of writers, to go to readings, to meet other writers, to know what other writers are, are are writing, and I, I might have shaved some time off those two decades if I if I'd done a better job of that. The kind of coincidental, the funny thing is, my friend who uh, who was the one with the low draft number who said, "Come on, let's do this. Uh, let's go ride ride some freight trains." He really taught me how to do it. He had an instinct for trains. He could he he could sense in a yard where you ought to go. He he uh, was just had a lot of skills and and. Uh, instincts for, for writing freight and I was kind of following learning from him. He became and still is the editor of a small paper in Oregon and so he, he actually has written two memoirs uh, about our trips together. One is called The Crowbar Hotel. We were in, we were in Canada once and we got thrown off the train by a, a constable who said I'm gonna you guys get caught here again you're gonna end up in the Crowbar Hotel which was his name for jail I guess. So, and then his other book, uh, Travelogue for an Unruly Youth. So he, he's written a couple of memoirs that he would claim tell the true story of what I've fictionalized in the book, although we argue about that sometimes. Is his name Jim Hunter? No, his name is uh, Jesse Burkhart.